Shall we begin? <clears throat> Thank you very much. So now we are ready. So last week we missed the session because I was moving. Um, it was my last evening in Oxford and uh, I moved the next day to Wiltshire where I'll spend my mains retreat. So that's where I am now. And, uh, and this will be the last Sutta class before I begin my retreat. It might not start promptly because there's still a little bit to sort out and things to settle in. Um, but hopefully it will start soon. <laughs> and it's really, really nice to invite all of you here in the virtual room to my new abode to charge it up with some good Dhamma vibes, and, you know, continuity and that sense of uh, connection to the wider community. It's very important and very beautiful to see that you're all here. So thank you for coming. And uh, today we're doing the second part of loving kindness. And um, last week we started on page 42, loving kindness and compassion. We discussed the four divine abodes how loving kindness shines like the moon and the classic 11 benefits of loving kindness. <clears throat> and I think I gave you some homework. I don't know if you remembered it for the last couple of weeks, but that was to actually practice some loving kindness in the evenings before you sleep and in the mornings when you wake up. So has anybody tried that at all? You don't have to have done it every day or, <laughs> yeah? yeah few nods happening not as many as could be happening so next week you have another chance <laughs> but uh the purpose of that really is because that really will bring about some of these benefits especially the ones connected with sleep you know it can really help to calm the mind and put you into more of a, a sleep mode um it can be a beautiful way to wind up the day you know to sort of uh, soften any resentments any hard feelings or uh, worry, concern that may have arisen in your day. Um, and to wish yourself well, you know, wish yourself good sleep. And this can be anything. You can choose your own phrases. You know, you can wish yourself well in so many ways. A friend of mine yesterday who I was speaking to said that um, a phrase that they like to use is, may I value myself. I thought that was really nice. May I value myself. It's more perhaps of a self-compassion phrase, but... I think so often we don't really value ourselves. We value everyone else or some other people in our lives, but sometimes we put them first and to our own detriment at times. And I'm guilty of that for sure. Um, and I think, yeah, also if we've had messages of not really feeling valued by those around us, maybe our parents or caregivers, we've not felt particularly valued or maybe by friends or partners, um, you know, we can have this tendency to seek it externally, to seek validation, to seek a sense of value, of worth externally. But what about if we could actually give that to ourselves? So I really like to uh, consider these sort of different approaches and consider what's pertinent to me, what's really helpful for me at any given time. So the 11 benefits, just to recap, are that one sleeps well, one awakens happily one does not have bad dreams, one is pleasing to human beings, pleasing to spirits, deities protect one, fire, poison and weapons do not injure one, one's mind quickly becomes stilled, here it says concentrated, it means it enters samadhi easily, because you're undermining that hindrance of ill will. And also generating a lot of happiness, metta has a natural sense of happiness about it which is a prerequisite for samadhi, it's the proximate cause. One's facial complexion is serene. You might have seen very beautiful people, physically beautiful, who are, you know, maybe not going on the right path in life. Maybe they're very angry or resentful or stressed in some way, and their features become contorted and actually quite unattractive to look at. Whereas there can be people who are not maybe conventionally attractive and yet their inner beauty shines forth. And I think that serenity, that um, complexion, the sort of glow that living a virtuous life can bestow upon us can really uh, it becomes clear and, and actually shines when we practice a lot of metta. Mm. I remember one time I was practicing metta. Yeah, that time and also a time in Myanmar when I first ordained for the first three months. Uh, it was in 2004 and I only had three months 
And uh, there were no mirrors or anything there. So I didn't actually see myself until right at the end. And I caught a look at like the reflection and I looked so almost angelic because there was just this real sense of serenity and it was really quite striking, you know? And it, it wasn't attached to a sense of self or a sense of pride or anything like that. It was actually just quite, there was a sense of, how can you say, like almost transparency. Like I, I seemed to look less solid somehow and everything was relaxed, everything was peaceful. It's as if actually the years kind of fall away from your face. So this is good marketing, isn't it, for a meta practice? Because everyone's looking for anti-wrinkle cream. <laughs> so, but this works. <laughs> this really worked. And actually, there are some studies that show that it increases those things. What do you call them? Teller, telomeres or something? The things that are good for anti-aging. It actually can yeah, keep them uh, longer or alive for longer. I forget. But it's, uh, it's really amazing how the Buddhist teachings at first sound maybe quite whimsical and then start to be proven in practical scientific terms. Then the 10th is that one dies unconfused. <clears throat> and the last is that if one does not penetrate further, one fares onto the Brahma world. So if one does not penetrate further, that also implies that loving kindness can be a basis to penetrate more deeply into insight, into liberating insight. And even otherwise, you will surely get a good rebirth. So when the liberation of mind by loving kindness has been repeatedly pursued, developed and cultivated, made a vehicle and basis, carried out, consolidated and properly undertaken, these 11 benefits are to be expected. Perhaps in varying degrees, but look out for them because that can be very encouraging to you. And if you don't see them, don't count it as a negative. Only look out for the ones that are there. Yeah. Don't say, but this one's not there. Never mind. Doesn't matter. One day you'll notice it too. So always look for the positives. So today we're on page 44. <clears throat> and uh, the first little excerpt is from the Samyutta Nikaya 20, number four, called Still More Benefits in this uh, anthology. So I shall begin. Community. If someone were to give away a hundred pots of food as charity in the morning, at noon, and in the evening, <clears throat> and if someone else were to develop a mind of loving kindness, even for the time it takes to pull a cow's udder, either in the morning, at noon, or in the evening, this would be more fruitful than the former. Therefore, you should train yourselves thus. We will develop and cultivate the liberation of mind by loving kindness, make it our vehicle, vehicle to liberation, make it our basis, our basis for the rest of the path, stabilize it, make it consistent, exercise ourselves in it, yeah? It is a cultivation and fully perfect it. So you take it to its peak, you take it as far as it goes until there's no more ill will left in your heart. Thus, you should train yourself. So I always find this quite fascinating that, you know, even developing loving kindness for a moment. How long does it take to pull a cow's udder? I don't know, but you can do it morning, noon or evening. That's more beneficial than 100 pots of food in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. That's 300 pots of food <laughs> to charity. So how come? Because surely loving kindness should be practical. It should manifest, right? It should help alleviate the suffering of others. Surely it's good to give. But your motivation for giving can be varied. Yeah. Um, and I think the point here is that even if you do acts of charity, unless you're purifying the mind from the root level, the deeper level, you know, you, you may not be overcoming defilements in a, in a more permanent way. Whereas if you're actually working with loving kindness as your intention, as your motivation of heart, then that is going to likely inevitably lead to many acts of generosity. Loving kindness and generosity go hand in hand. They're complementary aspects of each other. You know, where you find generosity, there there'll be loving kindness, true generosity, where you find loving kindness. Is that the opposite of what I'm saying? Where you find generosity, there'll be loving kindness. And where there's loving kindness, it has to manifest 
in more open heartedness, open handedness. Mm. You want to alleviate the suffering of others. You care for their well being the way a mother protects her only child. So it's bound to result in, in beautiful acts of kindness. And, and also, I think there's a wisdom to loving kindness that would mean you understand where people's true benefit lies. You know, sometimes it might be in offering food. Other times it might be in offering something else. Sometimes you might want to be there for a friend and they may need advice. Other times they just want to be heard. You know, wisdom can guide that along with the metta and that's when it becomes really powerful. It just makes me recollect, I was speaking to another friend today and saying that I have great respect for Ajahn Brahmali and I consider him somebody who's really a compassionate being. You know, he's obviously teaching and studying for so many years in order to bring the pure Dhamma, like the Dhamma of the Lord Buddha, straight from the suttas into practical terms so that we can, you know, apply it in our lives. And yet there are things I disagree with him about. And one of them is that um, he says compassion. I mean, please don't quote me on this directly, but he has said, I have heard him say once, that compassion is different from empathy and that you don't need empathy from compassion. And I find that quite interesting because surely compassion is focused on freedom from suffering. You don't have to be pulled into other people's distress and it may not be helpful to be. But for me, I feel that empathy has to accompany compassion in order for it to be truly effective and to truly touch and open the hearts of others. And I think, you know, there's a difference between empathy that starts to get sucked into other people's suffering and starts to get dragged down. And psychologically in neuroscience, that's known as empathetic distress. And that does lead to actually areas in the brain that um, light up when there is pain. So there's pain responses in the brain when you move into empathetic distress. But empathy can also inform and nourish compassion. So if we're able to empathize and then from that place of empathy, wish another freedom from suffering. This is very powerful. And I feel that this really um, complements and strengthens the compassion in ways that are very, very appropriate uh, to the situation at hand. So there's a few reflections which came from somewhere. <laughs> and uh, maybe I should pause because I've already been talking a while and that's the first little sutta so if we want to go back to that sutta or maybe you have some reflections of your own about perhaps why this may be the case that developing love and kindness even for a moment can be so incredibly powerful please do say if you wish to comment question join in the conversation So Leah has a hand up. I'm not sure if um, one of the co-hosts is doing the questions or I will do. Hi, hi. I've been unmuted. Hi. hi. Super. Hi, everybody. No, I just want to say that I have just <coughs> almost a year in my little village in Italy where it was beautiful and quiet and I've done lots of meditation and I thought it was quite a mystical experience, actually, because, you know, living in London, I'm a tour guide, it's really busy. And so... Coming back, it's been really interesting because I think it's me and the way I perceive people and the way I look at people, but it's like everybody's smiling. Huh. I'm wondering if it's, you know, like I'm wondering if it's my energy or the way that I feel because I just see that people smile at me all the time, you know, when I go for walks and things. And I really feel like I feel different, you know, about the way mm. I'm, I'm not caught in that energetic vortex that is London. Hmm. I'm more like, it's like, I, I'm really a lot slower and a lot pe more peaceful. And I, I'm like, everybody's smiling at me. What's going on? Wow. Oh, that's so great. What a wonderful um, realization yeah. and experience to have, you know, especially as you say, you're in this like fast paced city. Yeah. And yeah, it's an interesting question. Like how much of, of what we're seeing is really the reality and how much are we perceiving it through our own mental state. And I think, I mean, it is summertime. So my first thought was, yeah, British people in summer, they're much more cheery. 
But at the same time, I know what you mean. Like if you've been practicing and if you've been developing loving kindness and a sense of peace, then people pick up on that. I think so. I think so. I think that's what it is. Because actually, I think in London at the moment, there's quite a, a low energy. There's quite, it's quite heavy, the energy here mm. at the moment. Because mm. it, it can, we can really feel the city has gone through a, a yeah. very heavy time. Yeah, I mean, I've heard people refer to the COVID situation as a, as a trauma, you know, a collective global trauma. And I think that's true, because even if we haven't been directly impacted intensely, you know, with family members or friends dying or being very sick, it's all around us. How can we not be affected, you know? And you're hearing about countries, I mean, countries where I, I've lived and I love many people like India and, you know, it's happening all around us. We, we've been protected largely by the news, but the people who are on the ground there working in the NHS, I mean, it must have been living hell. Mm. You know, I don't think anybody can really conceive of that and so much you know, mental health issues as a result. And uh, yeah, I agree actually. I think the, the country's quite depressed mm. collectively and the British way is to sort of keep it in quite a lot. So it's wonderful because maybe they can also sense that, you know, you've got a different energy, you've been away. Mm -hmm. So you're bringing something a bit new, but I, I do, I mean, I have a similar experience, I have to say. I lived in London and I actually found people very friendly, but it was because I was smiling a lot. And on tubes, I say hi to people. Because yeah. sometimes, you know, you look at a person's face, you think they're not smiling, I better not say anything to them. And you just kind of judge them instead. And so oh, nobody's smiling. But what if we just smile? Mm. Actually, the smile is, just behind their mouth. It's not far. Yeah, <laughs> it's I not thought... far away. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Awesome. You're giving people permission to relax. And that's what it says in the previous sutta, right? You become dear to humans, pleasing to humans, dear is sometimes the translation. Yeah. So very yeah. good. Thank you, Venerable. We'll ask Maxwell to unmute. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hi. And uh, hi there. Um, I wondered if Ajahn Brahmali may have been referring to a study that um, a, a, a German uh, scientist did where they did MRI scans. Uh, and it was one of the monks who follows the Dalai Lama. And they did scans on him when he was empathetic uh -huh. and and the majority of the um of the sensation went to the amygdala mm -hmm. which is your flight and fright um and that there must be another part of of your brain where empathy goes to as well and that's the good yeah. empathy yeah and, and that's also where the the good compassion goes right but i think in the especially like for, for doctors, I think many younger doctors, they get the wrong sort of empathy, which, and, which goes to their sort of flight and fright process and, and makes them, well, then they burn out. Yes, yes. So uh, yeah. I'm just wondering if maybe Ajahn Brahmali was referring to, to to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he may have read those studies. I think he's also referring mm. just to the Buddhist concept, which is, um, as he understands it, just as a Brahma Vihara that's focused on freedom from suffering rather than getting too much into the suffering itself. And also the fact that the Brahma Viharas are supposed to be divine abidings would imply that there isn't really any suffering there. But I guess what I feel is that empathy has to be there too, or that if it is there as well, it um, informs and strengthens compassion. Um, and I, I think, like you say, the right kind of empathy will actually have a beneficial effect. And I think people can feel it. I can feel it myself when I speak to somebody who just says, oh yeah, I hope that this suffering ends for you soon. And they mean it compared to when somebody says, oh, I hear you, that must be really difficult. And I hope that, you know, things change for you soon. There's a big difference there for me because I feel like first I have to meet and feel met and feel that my 
distress is is um, validated and and you know and allowed, and then I can move beyond it. And I think for me that's the path in general. You know, we first have to meet and contact our suffering in order to really understand it. So I think, but whether we're speaking about the same thing or not, it's more a cause for reflection. It was just a comment he said that made me reflect, and I'm sure that he you know, does develop compassion in the right way. And I probably have more of a tendency to lean into empathetic distress. You know, that's, if I was a young doctor, I'd probably struggle with that and I'd need some training, you know, and I'm training on the job now. So, <laughs> you know, I, I do take on too much sometimes, you know, and, and get a bit sunk in that. So yeah, thanks for that. It's really interesting. You're muted again, so we can't, I don't know if you had another comment or you were just nodding no it's just very valuable what you do say thank you oh thank you thanks for offering that as well it's really fascinating stuff yeah i'll ask shirley to unmute i just wanted to offer a little reflection on the cow's udder because i've always thought well that's a very beautiful thought that you know you just have to have this momentary sort of loving kindness uh and it's very very meritorious but as you were reading that a memory came back to me at the time and i was really really grumpy feeling really really grumpy i was traveling and i just thought that's such an ugly thought that i have i should turn it around into a compassionate thought mm. and the whole thing just changed it's a bit embarrassing to give details, but because um, I was being very feeling very grumpy and it was a really rather, you know, very unworthy thought. But I just thought that's ugly. I'm going to change it around, and it was just a momentary decision Amazing. to actually turn that. And we can do that. We can notice that actually we're having ugly, ugly thoughts, and we can just make that decision in a finger snap, just to say. Right. I'm going to go down that way so I'm wondering if that's what he was referring for because that's that's quite powerful because then there's the response a different response as yeah. Leah was saying in a different thing I mean she was talking more generally but this is just a mentally <coughs> turning around yeah and that that actually that that memory although this probably I'm going back many 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 several decades that memory is still with me of, of of how that sort of changed the whole situation which could have yeah. been quite nasty so fantastic that's that as maybe a, a meaning for the, the right that. that's wonderful yeah that's so wonderful because i think that's true and i've had um similar experiences actually more in the meditation um I can't put my finger on one right now about in daily life, although I'm sure it's happened, but I've noticed sometimes in the meditation, I might be meditating thinking that I'm allowing things to be, thinking that I'm fairly equanimous. And yet suddenly I notice there's a resistance to the experience. There's like, okay, I'm with this suffering, you know, actually wanting it to go away. And as soon as I realize that and just relax and have a bit of compassion, a moment of compassion comes up, it, it can just, transform from a moment of suffering to almost like bliss can just start coming up in the mind and it's amazing it's it's like you say it's very quick and it's interesting when you were speaking I was also thinking not only can it have such a transformative effect but perhaps it's powerful precisely because of the amount of harm that can be eradicated the amount of potential harm that is then you know basically um, overcome in that one moment whereas giving food giving charity doesn't necessarily overcome anything particularly unwholesome. You may still feel angry or you still, still may use wrong speech. But when we, yeah, when we practice metta at that moment, it's not possible to maintain the anger, the unwholesome thought. So yeah, thank you. That's really great. And it's encouraging, isn't it? To know that it can change in a moment. Yeah. A moment of mindfulness a moment of that conditioning, the positive, wholesome conditioning arising in the mind, you know, and suddenly you're on the track again, you know, from something that seemed like so, and the antithesis of Dhamma into being fully and firmly on the path again. So 
I think that gives great hope and I hope everybody can take encouragement from this sutta. Um, yeah, and practice that way. Super, thank you. I love these discussions. <laughs> so shall we go, oh, hang on. Someone's put a note in the box. Um, okay. Oh, there's a few people with questions in the box. Wow, okay. Uh, I wonder whether rebirth in the Brahma world is conducive to Dhamma practice. I've heard conflicting views on this. Any thoughts? Well, what I have heard often and what makes a lot of sense to me is that practice in the human world is very conducive because we do experience a combination of suffering and happiness. Um, sometimes people say in fairly equal proportions, but I think it really depends on our particular situation. Um, and, you know, when, when you go through a difficult time, your whole life looks like difficult. And when you're feeling better, your whole life doesn't look that bad. It looks much lighter. So, but the point is that the contrast there sort of highlights the impermanent nature of both suffering and happiness and that we really don't have so much control. It can engender a sense of urgency sometimes. Um, and yeah, and also there's enough well-being, mostly, mostly, if we have the basic needs met to, to actually take steps on the path. We have the faculties as human beings. Mm. So I also used to think that it's not so great to be reborn in a Brahma world in terms of perhaps you can sink into a kind of complacency, but I think there's also a lot to be said for the fact that you know it's a result of your good karma you're probably not likely to create much bad karma while you're there so even though that karma may run out i don't think you're going to come down to a lower realm in a worse state you're probably going to carry a lot of the qualities from the brahma world with you um, if you do return to the human world and also some teachers say that even in the brahma world there may be sotapanas there may be stream enterers there may be wise beings who you can actually learn the dhamma from so we don't really know. And I think in a way, we don't have to worry too much either because if we do good and if we practice well in this life, we will get a good rebirth, whatever that may mean. Um, and we'll surely come in contact with Dhamma if that is the most important thing to us. You know? So I think we can make use of any situation and I don't think we need worry too much. It's out of our control anyway. So wherever you are, you have the opportunity. As long as, you know, the difficulty is when we go to the lower realms. <clears throat> that is much more difficult. But honestly, I mean, although I'm not like enlightened and with divine eye to tell people of their destiny, <clears throat> it's hard for me to believe that people on the path trying their best who may make mistakes, even if they make fairly bad mistakes, it's hard for me to believe they'll go down to hell or if they do that they'll stay there very long because what about all this wonderful comma? It's got to come up again. So don't worry too much, just keep walking on the path. So uh, I'm not seeing all the questions. Okay. What do you do when you feel that empathic distress? That's a great question. I personally think that's the time for self-compassion because at that moment you've almost left yourself. You've gone into somebody else's world and got sunk and it's not going to help them and it's not going to help you. You're basically draining your energy. So I think at that time, what I tend to do is hopefully remember <laughs> that uh, this is not helpful anymore, that it's gone off course, that I'm not actually able to see things very clearly. So I have a rest. And then if I practice meditation, I do so with a very gentle, tender attitude towards myself. and. Uh, Feel, feel that hurt, feel that uh, distress, but lightly with a light heart, with a heart that wishes myself well. So I think compassion, you know, oh, I feel you, I hear that this is hard. I mean, sometimes I see myself in the mirror, I just say, I'm sorry, sweetheart, you know, or like, yeah, this is hard right now. Like, oh, and it sounds kind of silly, but it's actually quite powerful when you do that because you're looking in your own eyes and you actually tell yourself, you know, oh, wow, you're okay. <laughs> you're basically okay. And I, I'm with you, you know? So you become your own friend. You give yourself some, some care and some company. And then uh, once you've taken care of yourself, you may be able to be more productively compassionate towards someone else. But it's a learning curve. And I think also 
for me, it's about learning to uh, notice before I go into empathetic distress that I'm about to go over my boundary, you know, and, and know where that boundary is. So to actually withdraw a little bit before you get into that empathetic distress. And the more compassionate we become to ourselves, the less tolerant we are of, you know, getting really distressed before stopping. We actually have enough compassion to, uh, to not go down that track too far. Mm. But it's hard. And I mean, maybe there's some trainings that you can do. I mean, I'm sure the doctors do some trainings in these things. Um, yeah, I think going numb isn't really helpful. I spoke to a friend today who's a nurse. She's also an ex-Bakuni. And she said sometimes she's noticed in her job, she works in the emergency department uh, in a city in Canberra. Uh, she said sometimes she notices that she's going kind of numb and not really feeling things, even when she's meeting people who are, you know, critically ill or, and that concerns her. And she's actually feeling like taking a, a five month break, actually a really long break and go into the bush, go on a long, long bush walk for five months. I mean, not everyone can do that, but <laughs> but I think there's something to be said of, you know, just taking care of our emotional world. Mm. So the next one is that only if you have achieved any of the states such as Sotapanna, Sakadagami or Anagami, then I suppose you can practice Dhamma to attain enlightenment in a Brahma world. Human realm is the best place to practice, according to my understanding. You may clarify it with Ben Chanda. Okay, so that's someone else replying to the previous question. So I think I said plenty on that. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You know, none of us really know. But I think, as I said, you can practice anywhere. Mm, I think that the qualities you develop in this life, the tendencies you develop in this life are very, very, very likely to follow you into others as well. Um, but yeah, the danger I think in those realms could be that, uh, the, uh, I mean, if there's delusion, if there's a lot of delusion there, some of these beings in the Brahma worlds can think that they're eternal and they can think that they're like omniscient and the creator of all the realms, all the worlds, you know, the gods think that they create every other realm, like God, right? God is creator of everything. Um, so that is one of the dangers because then when they pass away from those realms, there's obviously a lot of distress even those realms do fall apart. Um, but it's not something you need to worry about, really. I think there's a lot of fear in, in Buddhism and in just in human beings, right? About what happens if we do this or go here or what happens if we do this, will I be punished later? Don't worry too much, you know, as long as your intention is pure. You're doing your best, right? You don't always get it right, but you're sincere. Then, you know, you have good sealer, then don't worry too much about all these things. Yeah, you're on the path. Okay, next sutta is very lovely because it's a little bit different and it's uh, from the Samyutta 4719. I haven't actually opened that one. I should have done. Uh, ah, it's the one after the one I opened just now. Uh, so 47 is the Satipatthana Samyutta, yes. And uh, there's a similar sutta in the Bodjanga Samyutta, which is number 46. Um which talk about loving kindness going along with other qualities, such as mindfulness. So this is called loving kindness and right mindfulness. I will protect myself. Thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. That means the Satipatthanas. So Ajahn Brahm calls that the four focuses of mindfulness, which is nice because mindfulness is already established actually before we practice the Satipatthanas. So I quite like the four focuses of mindfulness, but the translation here is for the Satipatthana. So I will protect myself. Does anybody not know what the Satipatthana is? Is there anyone here in this? Okay, so let me just uh, mention what that is. And uh, basically the four focuses of mindfulness are the places to where we should direct our awareness. And those areas are the area of body, of feelings, of mental contents, and specifically the uh, factors of enlightenment and the five hindrances. Uh, the opposite of the factors of enlightenment. So the different tendencies of mind, the negative ones, as well as the positive. 
And the fourth of the Satipatthanas is, is the mind, the states of mind, the mind, mind consciousness, if you like. So the reason we direct mindfulness to those places is because they're the places that we usually identify with. We identify with those places as being me and mine, my body, my feelings, um, my moods. I'm this, I'm that, she's angry, they're terrible. These are all wrong identifications. And so when we actually direct our mindfulness to those areas, we start to see that they're impermanent you know the body is changing all the time the feelings are changing they can be pleasant unpleasant neutral but they arise and they pass away yeah and anything that arises and passes away cannot really be seen as a self it can't really be seen as something permanent something essential something worth keeping or trying to control so the four establishments of mindfulness or the four focuses of mindfulness are places that we start to investigate to uncover our delusions around the nature of the body and mind, the nature of this world, the nature of reality. So these are the practices that are very common in Vipassana meditation. When we've established a basic mindfulness, we then may take a subject matter. We can either contemplate the body or the feelings in the body. You know, we start to meditate and feel the sensations from top to toe. And uh, sooner or later, you'll start to notice the characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and non-self in those. So here we're talking about having loving kindness along with those practices of Satipatthana. And it's all about protecting oneself. This is the right motivation here of loving kindness. I will protect myself. Thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. I will protect others. Thus should the four focuses of mindfulness be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. And how is it, bhikkhunis, that by protecting oneself, one protects others? by the pursuit, development, and cultivation of the four establishments of mindfulness. It is in such a way that by protecting oneself, one protects others. And how is it, monks, that by protecting, one's, uh, by protecting others, one protects oneself? By patience, harmlessness, loving kindness, and sympathy. It is in such a way that by protecting others, one protects oneself. I will protect myself, thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. I will protect others, thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. Hmm. Very beautiful, isn't it? Very beautiful, it's giving a much broader description of and also purpose of the Satipatthanas. It's not a mechanical process, but again, it starts with this beautiful right intention. So when we approach the practice of the Satipatthanas with the intention to protect oneself and to protect others, of course, this is going to give a lot of meaning and purpose to those practices. It's not just for us, it's not just for others, but it's for both. So why does it protect ourselves and others? Any ideas? Why would practicing mindfulness of body, feelings, mental states and mind protect ourselves? And I think firstly, you know, it does protect us from the delusion of a sense of self, right? Why do we get angry? It's because we think these feelings are mine. You know, somebody's upset me now, I feel pain in the body and I'm angry about it because this pain is mine. I don't want this pain. If we can just see, okay, this is just pain. This is unpleasant sensation. It arises and passes away. It's not me, it's not mine, it's not a self. It's just sensation. Is there really any reason to feel anger? You know, we're not really angry with the other person, what they've said or done. We're angry with the sensation. We don't want to feel it. You know, we're angry because they made us feel something we don't want to feel, right? But what if we could accept those feelings? 
then we're protecting ourselves from that anger. And of course, obviously, we're protecting others as well. And I really love the passage about protecting others. How do we protect? How is it that by protecting others, we protect ourselves? By patience, harmlessness, loving kindness, and sympathy. In this way, we protect others. That, sorry, in this, it is in such a way that by protecting others, one protects oneself. So we're patient with others, we're harmless. We have loving kindness and sympathy towards others. Yeah. We protect ourselves again from ill will towards others, from covetousness towards others or others' possessions, maybe from lust towards others, from passion, from jealousy, from fear. Yeah. Instead, we develop attitudes of patience, harmlessness, loving kindness and sympathy. And do you notice how close these are again to the second factor of the noble path? Patience is an aspect of gentleness, yeah? Harmlessness, avihimsaka samkapa. Harmless rather than cruel, harmless rather than violent, gentle, we could call it gentleness. Then loving kindness again, metta, and sympathy. And I'm not sure here what the translation for sympathy is, but it could well be anukampa, which is the name of our project. Uh, it literally means resonating with compassion, something like that, or trembling uh, for others. Like, it's a kind of empathetic compassion, actually. And that's interesting that we chose that name, not by chance, of course. <laughs> Sympathy, yeah. It may also be daya, which means like empathy. That could be the translation, I'm not sure. But that's considered a positive quality. There is a Pali word for that. Hmm. It might be Sri Lankan name. I noticed there's a couple of Sri Lankans here. Do you know that name, Daya? Yeah, yeah. It means empathy, does it? Or, yeah, yeah, something like empathy, sympathy. Yeah, really interesting. So they're nodding for the camera, <laughs> just for the recording. They are nodding with that. So I love these qualities. This is so beautiful. And obviously, if you have this kind of attitude, you protected from any ill will. So I will protect myself, thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. I will protect others, thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. So loving kindness can go along as a motivation for the practice of mindfulness. And also it can be a way of looking as well. It can be a way that we perceive things. We can perceive our inner world with compassion, with sympathy, with, you know, not being violent, not being harsh with ourselves or with our experiences. Even if we have unpleasant, unwanted emotions arising, can we just be kind with them, be patient with them, you know? Wait for them to kind of run out of fuel. Sometimes that's all we can do, right? Just wait, just wait patiently, kindly, you know, in an in not with worry, not with um, a feeling of pushing things away. I've noticed that's a great quality also of sitting with a really uh, wise teacher. Even if you have to sort of tell your woes for half an hour, they just sit there kindly and patiently, not hurrying you up. You know, they listen, and after a while, you just start feeling better. <laughs> you run out of things to say. Right? You just start feeling, oh, this is all okay, actually. You know, it's being kind of reflected and someone's hearing me without worry, without, you know, rejection, without fear. And yeah, after a while, I don't know, I noticed that, especially with my female friends, to be honest, just talking about what's happening for me is sometimes enough. Yeah. And we can offer that to others too. So can we offer that to our mind states? Why can we offer that to our friends, but not to our mind? <laughs> Why? But like, can we see our mind as our friend? Isn't it normal that sometimes people's minds are grumpy? Sometimes people's minds are like confused. Would you expect your friend to be always in a good mood, always charitable, always wishing others well? It's impossible. You wouldn't expect it, would you, from a friend? So can we also just recognize that, oh, the mind is now full of lust. The mind is now angry. There is anger. 
there is lust rather than I am angry, I feel passion. Yeah, I am bad. <laughs> That's the worst, isn't it? When we, uh, you know, come to a conclusion about ourselves, yeah. our mythical selves. I did get out another sutta, which I just mentioned, which is in the Bojanga Samyutta. And this is also very nice because here it talks about how loving kindness can accompany all of the Bojangas. And for those who don't know what the Bojangas are, Boj is kind of like Bodhi. It's, uh, it's, uh, it basically means enlightenment and anger means like, not anger, not angry. Uh, it means limb. So it means the limbs or the wings of enlightenment. These are the factors of enlightenment. And the first one is mindfulness. Now they haven't listed the others, but hopefully I'll remember. The second one is Dhamma Vichaya, which means investigation of states. And then the next one is Virya. No, not Virya. The next one is uh, Piti, am I right? So joy or bliss, rapture. And then the next one is tranquility. Yeah. And then uh, is the next one Sukha? Where is these? The next one should be sukha, which is happiness, I think. Yeah, they always put dot, 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 and now I'm tired to remember anything. Um, so PT, and yeah, I think it's pasadi, actually. It's um, tranquility, and then sukha, and then equanimity. Yeah, so it's very similar to the other sequences, but it ends with equanimity. So here the Buddha says, that um, how is the liberation of mind by loving kindness developed? And this is the Bojanga Samyutta. So it's number 46, 54, for those who may want to look it up later. It's this big book, Samyutta Nikaya. So 46, 54, accompanied by loving kindness. So how is the liberation of mind by loving kindness developed? What does it have as its destination, its culmination, its fruit, and its final goal? Here, monastics, a monastic develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness accompanied by loving kindness. And then it carries on the enlightenment factor of investigation, the enlightenment factor of piti, of rapture, of tranquility, of happiness, of equanimity. I know I'm missing something out here. I'm just too tired right now to remember everything properly. But anyway, you can look it up. <laughs> um, and then those enlightenment factors accompanied by loving kindness are based on seclusion, dispassion and cessation, maturing in release. So it's just very interesting and I'm not going to go into it in detail now, but it's interesting to know that we can and we should develop loving kindness along with the path along with every aspect of the path. Because sometimes, again, people think that loving kindness is just something to practice sort of as an add-on or at the end or something like this. And it's not really a very integral part of the path, but this sutta and the previous sutta would show that that's not the case. That the loving kindness accompanies everything we do, right from the motivation in the beginning, along with the actual practice and the experience of these factors of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So it's very beautiful that that is the case. And I think, does someone have their hand up now? I've got a message saying that they do, but I don't see a hand. So please. Uh... It's Rob, I'll hand over to Rob. Great. Hi. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so that suitor suggests that the, uh, the Brahma Viharas fits into the seven factors of enlightenment right at the beginning. Yeah. Mindfulness. And I've always wondered where it would actually sort of fit in. But that kind of pretty much says it right from the beginning, yeah? And it does, doesn't it? And I don't see why not, because again, in the Eightfold Path, it's from the beginning. I mean, even a part of right view is the appreciation that all beings suffer and want to be free from suffering. So there's already a sense that, you know, we start to practice because we, we understand that as just as we suffer, so do others. And you know, everyone is looking for a way out. Everybody's looking for their happiness in their own way. So I actually think it's part of right view. And then that feeds into right motivation, the second factor of the Eightfold Path, which is, you know, again, um, so nekama, renunciation. That could be renunciation of anything unwholesome, right? Renunciation of anything that's not leading to the goal. 
um, renunciation, letting go, non-possession, non-control. And then the second one is avyapada, which means loving kindness. It means benevolence. That's right motivation, right intention. There's an intention of loving kindness. And the last one is, um, is avihimsaka, which means non-violence, uh, non-cruelty. In other words, gentleness, harmlessness. So this idea of uh, non-harming and, and loving kindness has to be there from the start. And it's only after that that we're able to live an ethical life, a life of virtue. It's a natural consequence of having a beautiful motivation. If your motivation is right, then your actions of body and speech are going to be in line with that motivation. You know, you can't have a motivation or, you know, an attitude of loving kindness and then shout at someone. That's not an attitude of loving kindness. So it's likely that if you have loving kindness, you'll be generous, you'll be... Um, compassionate you'll be you know you'll you'll put care into the way you communicate with others you'll try to speak in a non-harmful way um, you'll engage in acts of charity you know so if we're coming from the right place it's going to lead to a lot of good in this world mm. and then from the virtue from the sila the the rest of the eightfold path continues right so into right effort right endeavor the endeavor to you know um to not allow unwholesome states to enter the mind and to eradicate those that have arisen. The effort to cultivate wholesome states and to have them develop, to maintain those states in our mind. And from there we have right mindfulness. So, you know, this loving kindness has been there all along, long before we have right mindfulness and it's part of right mindfulness, you could say. It has to imbue mindfulness. And that's why I think it's really ingenious that Ajahn Brahm coined this beautiful word, kindfulness. You know, mindfulness and kindness together. And I think that just brings out the fact that they have to go hand in hand. So, and then that will lead you into samadhi. And the other beautiful thing is that if you have mindfulness along with loving kindness, that loving kindness is acting as an antidote to any ill will that may arise. So you don't have to sit there and just go, oh, anger, 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 let me observe the anger. You're actually having loving kindness to it, and that will be a direct antidote. So it's really, it's like having a computer, like your computer is the, this is probably a terrible simile, but anyway, your computer is your mindfulness and your meta is your like antivirus on the computer or something to make sure everything's running well. Mm. Otherwise, you can be mindful wanting, thing, wanting to get rid of things. Like, I'll be mindful so that this difficult sensation disappears. I'll be mindful because I want to improve myself because I hate myself. You know, someone actually said that to me after 15 years of practice. They said, yeah, sure, I like being mindful because, yeah, it's because I want to improve myself because I hate myself. That's not a motivation of metta. I, I felt very sad by that. I, I, I kind of presume that most people practice out of, I don't know, more compassion, even self-compassion, at least. Yeah. So yeah, have that loving kindness from the start and keep developing it. So one more question. I will ask Janaki to unmute. Um, mindfulness, I've, I, I understand it as something like um, awareness or being conscious mm -hmm. of everything that you think or you, what you do, your, your actions as well as your thoughts. So that's what I understand as a mindfulness. Mm -hmm. conscious, uh, being conscious or uh, being aware. That aware. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's certainly true. I mean, mindfulness is that part of the mind which is aware of what's arising yeah in the present moment but it's a little bit more than that as well because it's also implies it also has an ethical element that we're mindful in a way that actually undermines the whole unwholesome states we're mindful in a way that increases the wholesome states so there's also an aspect of mindfulness called the gatekeeper and there's a, a sutta on that in the Majum, in the Anguttara Nikaya and I forget the exact sutta, but I've talked about it before quite recently in a retreat. Uh, and it talks about, I can't remember which retreat this was, but it talks about how mindfulness should help us to keep out 
the unwholesome qualities and mindfulness should help us increase the wholesome ones. So it also has this aspect of right effort within it. It's like that simile, which I can't quite resist because I don't know a better one of Ajahn Brahm who, <laughs> by Ajahn Brahm, who makes a bit of a cheeky joke really, because of course no tradition is as stereotypical as this, <laughs> but he makes this slightly cheeky joke whereby um, this very rich lady has a, a house full of, you know, goodies that are obviously quite attractive to people who may want to rob it. And uh, she goes on holiday and instructs the gatekeeper to uh, be very mindful so that nobody um, steals her things. And so this gatekeeper says, yes, yes, madam, I'll be really mindful. And then these people come in while she's away and, and he knows he's very mindful. He says, oh, look, robbers coming in, robbers coming in. And then they go into the house, robbers going in the house, in the house, in the house. And then they come out, taking out this, taking out this, robber going out. <laughs> and then, you know, it continues, of course. Like uh, they probably think what a useless gatekeeper. So they go in and robbers going in, robbers going in. Then they bring out the safe, safe going out, safe going out. <laughs> and they take everything. And then this lady comes back from a holiday and basically says, what happened? I told you to be mindful. And he says, lady, I was mindful. I noted robbers going in, robbers going in, <laughs> robbers coming out. She's like, yeah, but that's mindfulness without wisdom. We have to be mindful. We have to know what to be mindful of. Yeah, because sometimes we think we can be mindful of anger. But actually, if you're really mindful of anger and you really see how it's harming you, you see it with wisdom, that, that anger will disappear. If it keeps on arising, you're fueling it somehow. You're fueling it somehow. So perhaps in that awareness, perhaps in that mindfulness, there is actually a little bit of ill will. So I think, you know, we need to um, be careful of how we're aware. Most of the time, it's not objective bare awareness. It's actually infiltrated by some of the hindrances, however subtle they may be. So I think it's like different degrees of mindfulness as we practice. What we once thought was mindful, we now realize is not really objective and bit by bit we purify it and become more and more unbiased more and more objective um, as the hindrances decrease so that's why the factors of enlightenment and the five hindrances are seen almost like opposites as the five hindrances decrease so the mindfulness increases as the mindfulness increases so the five hindrances should be decreasing the two kind of are opposites yeah so i hope that makes some sense it's a big topic mindfulness but it's a obviously a very important part of the path. So I'll read the last one now because it's good to finish this chapter before my retreat and, uh, and we'll see if we have time for any more comments on this. So this is called Destruction of the Influxes and it's from the Majima 52, uh, the name of which I do not know offhand, but you can look it up. So, Venerable Ananda is speaking to the householder named Dasama. So that's just a little background. Again, householder, a monastic dwells developing one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third quarter. Like, oh, likewise, the fourth. Okay. Thus, above, below, across and everywhere and in every way, one dwells pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, vast, exalted, measureless, without enmity and without ill will. One considers this and understands it thus. This liberation of mind by loving kindness is constructed and produced by volition. But whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent, subject to cessation. If one is firm in this, one attains the destruction of the influxes, the asawas. But if one does not attain the destruction of the influxes, or Ajahn Brahm calls it the outflowings, actually, because asawa can be both. If one does not attain the destruction of the, let's say, outgoings, outflowings, because of the attachment to the Dhamma, because of the delight in Dhamma, then with utter destruction of the five lower fetters, one becomes one of spontaneous birth due to attain final nirvana there without ever returning from that world. So don't worry about the last part here, that's kind of quite technical, but it's basically saying that even if you're not fully enlightened, but you may be an anagami, 
you will still not come back into this world, but you'll become enlightened from the world you go on to. So it's a pretty good deal, basically. This is a pretty good deal. And this is, <laughs> and this is a really, I love this passage and I quote this quite a lot because to me, this is again, one example of how loving kindness can lead to enlightenment. You know, it can lead to very deep wisdom. So one way of loving kindness leading to deep wisdom is seeing the conditioned nature of perception. That, you know, when we have a mind of loving kindness, like Leah was saying, suddenly everyone looks like they're smiling. <laughs> everyone looks sort of, you know, happy. Is it true or not? Or is it just that you've got meta in your mind and you, that's what you pick up? If you're in a bad mood, you might not notice that. You might notice all the grumbles, all the things that anger you, all the dirty kind of paper on the streets or, you know, the smelly smog in London. Yeah, much of our reality is created by our mind, if not the whole thing. And so when we practice metta, we start to see that, wow, our perceptions are changing. You know, perception is actually conditioned. It's malleable. It's not always the same. When you're in a good place, you look upon your whole life as something that led you to that good place. Oh, even the difficult things, they weren't really that difficult. They really had to happen because they taught me so much and that's why I'm happy now. But when things aren't going well, oh, this thing, bad thing happened and this bad thing happened and this is why. I'm so miserable now, right? Your whole life looks kind of like a disaster. So our perception is conditioned. Our perception of others is conditioned. When we have a mind of loving kindness towards a person who may even be not very liked by us, suddenly they become, okay, they become quite a decent chap, really. You know, or the neutral person. Many people say when they practice with the neutral person, after a while they need to find a new one because they become a friend. They become upgraded to the category of friend <laughs> have they really changed i mean you don't even know this person it's your mind isn't it putting them in different categories seeing them in different light in a different light so the perception is conditioned that's very clear but this goes one step further and actually it seems to be reflecting on those states afterwards and here where it says the liberation of the mind i think we're talking about states of jhana we're not talking about full enlightenment, we're talking about vimutti here, uh, or vimo vimoka maybe, I'm not quite sure, but when both of those words are mentioned, it usually refers to the jhana states. So being free from the five senses, being free from the um, sense world, free from the hindrances, of course, um, and abundant, exalted, measureless, without enmity, without ill will, that shows that your mind is suffused by loving kindness. You've, you know, you've really um, made the mind great, so at this time, there are no more hindrances left. But after this, we reflect that that liberation of mind by love and kindness is still constructed and produced by volition. It's still a, a um, conditionally arisen. It's not always there. It's not always the case. There were certain things you did to get into that state. And of course, it's much more refined, it's much less fabricated than states of defilement, you know, like anger and ill will, but, uh, but still, it's not the final goal. So then we reflect whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent and subject to cessation. So even these things don't last, and that's when you can move beyond the Brahma realm. You know, as I said earlier, if you feel that this is it, you're a Brahma now and you've done your job, it's going to be really tragic, isn't it, when you start to realize, oh, my goodness, I'm also fading away. I'm dying. I'm moving again to the human realm or into even a lower realm. So we start to see that they're also not permanent. And then the um, Nibida arises. Here it doesn't say this, but usually in this sequence, um, it's the Nibida, the turning away from this world, turning away from the five senses, from samsara. Nibida and then viraga, things start to fade. Yeah, we lose our passion, we become dispassionate to the world, things actually start to fade away and then cease. Things fade away because we don't give them our interest anymore, and so they cease, they stop. We're not fueling them anymore. So, whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent and subject to cessation. So, even these states you can't hold on to, mm? they're going to cease. If one is firm in this, they attain destruction of the influxes. That means full enlightenment. And if not, 
because you still it says attachment to the dhamma here it'd be interesting to know what that word attachment is it's probably yoga something and a yoga like yoked to because of delight in the dhamma um then you become basically uh, an anagami second stage of in third stage of enlightenment like the second highest stage so you still abandoned all ill will all craving you just have that little bit of attachment if you like to the dhamma sometimes as your brown describes it as a little bit of attachment to the jhana states you know it can be you still delight in those a little bit but uh it's not a big problem because you're not going you're just going to fade away gradually bit by bit without taking another birth in this realm so pretty good isn't it pretty good deal this meta practice and uh, all the way from the beginning right through to the end so hopefully that is encouraging and uh yeah i will maybe we just sit together for oh we have to do the dana talk as well oh the next chapter is dealing with anger so um Maybe what I'll say is that uh, since I'm now on retreat for the next three or four months, uh, hopefully we'll be starting again if I'm alive and if you're alive in uh, October, the end of October. Um, you've got three months between the chapter of metta and anger. So maybe you can practice metta for three months. And then when we meet again, you won't have a lot of anger or you'll be able to tell me how you worked with your anger whether meta helped when it sometimes didn't help and it's all good because sometimes loving kindness practice helps us see where we're still holding on to anger yeah it exposes those things which are in its way you know we reach obstacles we reach blockages and that is precisely uh where you see what the obstructions are and what the work is that you need to do so we can learn to soften around those so if you wish i would suggest adding some loving kindness to your practice even if you already do a lot add a little bit more yeah and that can be either well i'm teaching it tomorrow morning so <laughs> for those who are awake in my time zone 9 a.m english time bst it's a bit early for those in america uh unfortunately but i'm sure there are some sessions already on the youtube channel we usually do about 40 minutes 45 minutes of loving kindness practice otherwise you can find plenty of things online yeah. Just pick some phrases, repeat those to yourself with sincerity and listen to the direction that those words are pointing in. And bit by bit, you're inclining your mind to the experience of loving kindness. And you can always also practice just by infusing your awareness with a bit of warmth, a bit more friendliness, a bit more warmth. You know, really welcoming yourself into the space, really welcoming your body, welcoming the sensations, welcoming even the most difficult of emotions, just letting them be. Yeah. Opening the door of your heart is a really nice summation of loving kindness practice. Good. So I hope to see you all either tomorrow, maybe not all, or um, Sunday evening also, a little Dhamma talk. I don't know if it will be a talk or whether I'll just make a sort of discussion community session because it's the last time we'll meet. Uh, and yes, oh, I'm going to miss you all. But I will be delighting in my own practice, hopefully, and also sharing it with everybody. Yeah, because what's the point, actually, if we're only practicing for ourselves? So my practice will be pr protecting myself and protecting you as well. And uh, may all the merits, all the happiness, all the peace, yeah, and all the challenges that arise, may they all go to inspire strengthen encourage you on your path as well may they all be shared with all of you here and may you all delight in being part of this wonderful community and this wonderful journey on the path you're all supporting me you're all supporting each other so don't forget that you're valued you're cared for and you have what it takes to continue on this path all the way to the goal i have no doubt at all okay so there will be a small little talk about Dana now, very brief, and then uh, we can wave goodbye. <laughs> Thanks.
Thank you very much, Venerable Chanda, for this evening's discussion. And I can't believe this is the last one before the rain <laughs> already. Uh, so I'd like to say uh, an extra thank you to you for organizing these sessions because it's been so wonderful to read the suttas and be able to reflect on them and discuss them together in this mm -hmm. way. So thank you very much for that. And I would like to say a few words about dana and the practice of generosity, which is uh, so important on our path. Uh, and if anyone here would like to offer dana your gifts, whatever you are able to give, will continue to provide for Venerable Chanda's material needs while she's on retreat and help her mm -hmm. to continue spreading the Dharma. Um, and of course, supporting the setting up and the development of the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK. Uh, more information can be found on the Anukampa website, and I have posted a link in the chat box. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Kelly, so much, and thank you to every co-host who's here tonight. So Kelly and uh, Matthias and Gunther, I think Gunther's connection wasn't so great, so he wasn't able to be active, but nonetheless he was here to support the group. And also warmly welcoming Leah and Shirley, because while I am on retreat, we do have a program for you for four months. Um, and it's just going to be like every month there'll be a, a guest speaker, um, a, a bikuni. So for July, first Sunday in July and first Sunday in August, it will be Aya Chittananda from the US. And then in uh, August and September, no, July, yeah, August and September will be Aya Ananda Bodhi, who also many of you know, and she's from California. She's actually Welsh, but anyway, she's from, she lives in the US. And there will also be peer led sessions on the third Sundays of each month by Leah. So Leah will basically um, just introduce the evening and facilitate a little bit the discussion and play a Dharma talk. One week she's playing a film, and I think it's really nice to be there for that. And uh, to have some discussion around that because it's quite interesting to get all these different perspectives on uh, bikunis and bikuni ordination from people all around the world, the naysayers and the yaysayers all. So that'd be nice. And uh, also Shirley's going to lead one as well. So uh, you're in good hands and please do come along if you can. I mean, it might seem like it's not the same without a live teacher, but you can watch a talk and get the same feel from the group. And the thing is that it isn't just me, it's actually the whole container, it's the community that's developing that gives that support. And so you will have time every week to also discuss in small groups together. And that can be very enriching, especially if you're feeling a little bit alone. So that's twice a, uh, a month. So hopefully that will be some support and I'll be back in October. But yes, I will see you tomorrow, Meta and Sunday evening as well before then. So take care everyone and we'll unmute you so that you can wave goodbye if you wish.